It took me a year and a half to write this book and another year and a half to publish it. So you can imagine um, how happy I am to be here and to speak to you about my book, to actually have copies, to be able to sell them, to be able to speak to you about the contents of the book. Um, it's somewhat frustrating for me that I can't speak about all that's in the book. I'm going to speak to you about a part of what is in the book. And what I hope to speak to you about tonight really uh, concerns uh, my desire to give you um, more sort, sort of apologetic power um, to empower you to use modern science against atheists, uh, not to be afraid of modern science, but actually to be more aware of the discoveries of modern science and to use them uh, against atheists on behalf of the Catholic faith. There's many other aspects of the book that, that go into modern science uh, that do things such as attack evolution, um, but I, I feel like it would be most profitable for me to speak about uh, a specific aspect of my book that's somewhat controversial among in traditional Catholic circles, but I, I believe will help empower you, as I say, give you certain resources for fighting against atheists. So let's just get into it. Let's speak about the contents of the book. Yeah, I'm um, pressing the pre page forward button, but um, it's making beautiful music. <laughs> Okay, I gotta press the down button. <laughs> I was pressing the up button. <laughs> so this book, as Father Franks mentioned, is about your mental balance. It's about the way you look at reality. Um, effectively, I say that there are three different ways in which you can look at reality. Um, three different reality mentalities. So one way is the way of the empiricist, and the empiricist is the person who believes that the only valid knowledge is knowledge that comes through your senses, through your eyes, your ears, your nose, uh, your external senses, also your internal senses, the imagination that's associated with the firings of the neurons in your brain, uh, these sorts of things. And they reduce all valid knowledge to sense knowledge, to body knowledge. This is the knowledge that we have in common with the animals um, that comes through our body. And this is the reality mentality that exists today. Um, I was just thinking, I've, I've got this other device here. It's got a nice laser, yeah. So, <laughs> so that's the empiricist. Um, that's one way, one reality mentality. Um, the second reality mentality is the idealist, and those are people who do not start with looking at reality. They start with some idea that they've gained. Perhaps they've gained this idea from a sacred text that's been taught to them by their religion. Perhaps they've got this idea from just their own um, steam, as it were. They've, they've come up with this idea. They're very entranced with this idea. And they then go and apply that idea to reality. And no matter what reality teaches them through their senses, they will refuse to accept the sense state as holding validity. They will hold that their idea is the only valid means for knowing what reality says or does not say. And those are called idealists. Um, there are certain philosophers in history such as Plato, Hegel, and Berkeley um, who have held this reality mentality. And my claim in the book is that we all uh, should be realists um, a realist being someone who's willing to accept both the body knowledge that comes through our senses and the knowledge of ideas. Accept the validity of ideas as giving true knowledge, accept the validity of our senses as giving true knowledge. And what I try to argue is that this is the human way of knowing. This is the way God has constructed us to know reality. We're meant to know in a sort of uh, two-stage fashion through our senses and also through our spiritual faculty, our mind. And unless you're willing to accept the knowledge that you gain from both of those types of faculties, then you will necessarily fall into irrationality. Now, these reality mentalities, the technical name for that is an epistemology. It's a Greek word that just means your theory of knowledge. So reality, your reality mentality is also known as your epistemology. 
So what I do in order to make, you know, this, you're already probably getting the sense, some of you are already getting glazed eyes, you know, you're just like, <laughs> whoa, this is really abstract, um, you're killing me here, Father. Um, so what I try to do during the book is I try to make this um, abstract material as approachable as possible, and the main device I use throughout the book is something I call the epistodometer. It's a meter by which I sort of evaluate people's reality mentalities. And this um, image, um, this, is, this is done by Michael Sestak, by the way. I mean, he really did a fantastic job. I appreciate him um, making my very klutzy epistodometer into this very professional looking epistodometer. Um, but what I try to do is, is divide those three reality mentalities. On, on this side, you've got the empiricists who hold that only body knowledge is valid. On the other side of the epistodometer, you've got the idealist who only holds that intellectual knowledge is valid. And in the middle, you've got the realist who's willing to accept both uh, sense knowledge and intellectual, uh, intellectual knowledge. So the epistodometer in the middle is uh, white, indicating that when you've got your epistodometer calibrated to that perfect vertical position, then reality will both be most lightsome for you. You'll be able to see most deeply into reality. But when you fall into one of these other epistemologies on the right or on the left, it, reality will be very dark for you. So this is the thesis of my book that the more your reality mentality deviates from realism, the more obscure really reality becomes for you, and the more it approaches perfect realism, the more intelligible reality becomes for you. So what you need to do if you want to gain the, uh, or penetrate the most into reality is you've got to think as much as possible according to the way that God has created you. You've got to think as a realist. God has made you as a realist. He's made all human beings to think as realists. And so you're going to be uh, the best one approaching reality if you are a realist, if you think as a realist. OK. So you know, the, the, the big question we might, might ask at this point is, so where does your reality mentality come from? Um, how do you develop your reality mentality? And um, let's just say we in this room, I mean, we're, we're traditional Catholics, so it's very obvious that our worldview, the way we look at reality, is very much um, influenced by our Catholic faith. That is the predominant thing in our life that tells us how to look at reality. But for most people, it's not that way. So what, one thing I try to do is I try to see in the past, in past cultures, in, hi in the history, in sort of the intellectual history of mankind, where do the worldviews of various cultures come from? And what I find is that um, the worldviews of most cultures in the past has been driven by religion, some form of religion, pagan religion, Protestant religion, Catholic religion, whatever. Um, Whereas our modern world is driven more by an empiricist uh, scientocracy, where science often, scientific materialism often di dictates the worldview today. So people who have not been given a worldview growing up, typically they will adopt the worldview of materialism. That's the dominant uh, worldview today. So um, I look at history and I, and I say, what I find what, what, is that when you have religion influencing your worldview, often the religions of the past have pushed peoples towards idealism. They give people a set of ideas, which those people then go impose on reality. No matter what reality teaches them, they stick to the ideas that the religion has imposed upon them. Whereas my claim is, and it's an historical claim with actual historical data behind it, is that Catholicism, in the Middle Ages especially, pushed people towards realism, and specifically enabled the, the Catholic Middle Ages to give birth to modern science. This is on the historical record, as I say, and I make the argument in chapter five. Then our modern worldview, um, we, are, we are pushed towards the worldview of empiricism by today's atheistic science. So 
the book, I split the book into three sections. The first section, I consider realism in itself, the system of realism, this philosophical system of the way you look at reality. And I show uh, how a person would look at reality if they are a realist, what sort of conclusions they would draw about the ultimate principle of reality. Um, they would draw, uh, they would easily conclude to an immaterial God, for instance. I give a proof for the existence of God. Then I also indicate where they would situate religion and science in their view of reality if they are a realist. Then in the second section of the book, I consider religions of the past and the reality mentalities of different cultures that were driven by religion. So I start off by considering pagan religions, and generally speaking, pagan religions were the people were very, very confused about reality. They didn't really have a, a very systematic, philosophical, rational view about reality because they were driven by mythological stories um, that led them astray. However, the Greek pagans were an exception. They were sort of the chosen people of reason. They're sometimes called the chosen people of reason because they were able to create an environment wherein they were able to use reason and independence of religion. And they birthed um, philosophical thought. They birthed, we may say, realist philosophical thought. So Aristotle was the first professional realism realist. He, we may say, invented professional realism. But then, as I say, Catholicism took Aristotle's realism and it brought it to an all new level. It perfected the realism of Aristotle, which was still imperfect um, because he, Aristotle was not able to see certain things but because of the influences of the paganism around him. Then in chapters six and seven, I look at Islam and Protestantism, and what I find, again, is that they push their believers towards idealism, which the, these, the often Protestants and Muslims take certain ideas from the Quran or the Bible um, that have not been revealed by God, and then they go and impose them on reality, regardless of what reality says. As I say, I would love to, to get into these aspects of the book, but we'd be here till the wee hours of the morning. And um, I want you to buy the book. I, I, I mean, that's my main <laughs> purpose here. So I don't want to keep you here a long time. Um, so uh, the third section of the book, I look at modern science. I look at the modern worldview, and I try to pick apart modern science and see especially uh, how people think who try to reduce all knowledge to scientific knowledge. And I try to show how that leads to irrationality. First of all, um, science in general, the birth of modern science, people like Isaac Newton trying to um, reduce all knowledge to scientific knowledge. Then, in specific, in chapters 9 through 11, chapter 9, I look at physics, um, the explanations that modern physicists give for uh, the, the, the universe itself. Chapter 10, the attempts to explain where life came from, uh, try to explain how life came from non-life and how they fall into irrationality, um, trying to reduce all explanations for life to uh, material causes. Then lastly, chapter 11, um, how they try to explain that more complex life comes from less complex life by means of merely material causes. As I say in all four of these chapters, I try to connect it with the thesis of the book that is, if you are not a realist, then you fall into irrationality. If you try to reduce all knowledge to merely sense knowledge, then in these areas, physics, origin of life studies, evolutionary studies, you fall into irrationality. So I, I, I sort of poke holes in um, the, the modern scientific conclusions that some atheists make. Um, so that's, that's the book in general. We can't talk about the whole book. You know, um, I, I try not to bring up how long the book is because I want you to read the book. Um, but uh, it's a long book, but the text is very big. It's huge. So um, you go through the text very, very quickly. I mean, I assure you, it's just, <laughs> if you have trouble with the first three chapters, just skip to chapter four. Uh, it'll go even quicker. So um, I want to talk about my favorite chapter, um, chapter nine. Um, Yes, because that's a chapter where I'm most sarcastic, speaking <laughs> about the atheist. Yes, um, it was a lot of fun. So, um, 
I, I look at the um, atheist empiricists and how they try to explain that uh, explain reality without having recourse to God. So you have to think about if you were an atheist. I mean, just try to um, sort of abstract from, from your traditional Catholicism for a moment and think about if you were an atheist, how would you try to give a rational account for your atheism? What would you try to do? And that's, that's what we have to try to think about in the next 10 minutes. Um, what sort of explanations you would try to give to, to sort of justify intellectually your position. Um, so I, what I show is that the atheists, logically, they try to turn the universe into God, but the problem is the universe won't let them. So science um, in general, I mean, anybody who does science, they try to explain physical phenomena in terms of natural causes. They try to give um, the answer to the question, how? How does this happen? Um, and they explain, explain how things happen in, means, in terms of physical forces, in terms of material causes. But what atheists claim is that when they're done explaining things in terms of merely material forces, that that is a complete explanation, that there is no other explanation that can be given, that it's the end of the story. The total explanation has been given when they're done giving a physical, a merely physical explanation. So they try to say that science accounts for absolutely everything that needs to be or can be explained in things. Um, what that means for the other branches of knowledge, such as philosophy and theology, is that they explain absolutely nothing because philosophy and, and theology um, make use, heavy use of ideas. They don't make heavy use of sense knowledge. Uh, you can't trace these abstract ideas back to sense knowledge um, directly. You can only trace them back indirectly. So they, scientists, these atheistic science, scientists, they say only sense data accounts for real knowledge. Therefore, philosophy and theology are no good. Um, question, does science really explain everything? No way. I mean, of, of course not. Um, f for one thing, these scientists are taking a philosophical position. You know, empiricism is not a scientific position. It's a philosophical position. In other words, you don't become an empiricist by measuring things. It's not measurements that teach you to be an empiricist. It's rather a philosophy that you choose to adopt by an act of your will. But beyond that, I mean, um, they can't explain the origin of human concepts that are used to formulate and explain scientific theories. Scientific theories themselves are, are idealizations of uh, material reality. They cannot give any reason why certain things exist and others do not. And the only thing they can do is, say, is to say that why questions are invalid questions. That they know they can't answer why questions. Why do things exist as opposed to not exist? And the only thing they can do is say, well, those questions are out of bounds. You can't ask those questions. But um, another thing they try to do is to try to justify that science gives a total explanation they, they try to pretend that, that science, when science has had its say, that basically um, their explanation of the universe shows that the universe is totally self-sufficient. There's no need to have recourse to God in any way to explain the universe. That once physics, especially, has said all it has to say about the universe, then there's no need for the God hypothesis um, to explain anything else. So they do this by trying to confer upon the universe the attributes of God. So um, in chapter 9, I try to show how they take the size of the universe and they try to show the universe is infinite in size. They try to say that the universe effectively stays absolutely the same. You know that God is immutable. God doesn't change. So they apply that to uh, the universe. The universe doesn't change. They say that God is infinite. Well, the universe is infinite. Um, God is simple. He's absolutely simple. They try to say that the universe is homogenous. It's just sort of plain vanilla um, all across the universe. It's absolute sameness. And that the, the universe is uncaused. That nothing, absolutely nothing, um, has caused the universe. The universe is a self-existing thing, self-existing reality. This is, this is very important for us going ahead and, and seeing how 
um, we would refute the atheist. Um, we, would, we would really make the atheist uncomfortable by means of science. So I told you about how I want to empower you through this conference and give you the means to counter atheists on their own ground. All right? Because atheists um, generally are very bad philosophers. So it's not good to go against them with philosophy. It's very nice if you're able to go against them using science itself, which they feel is, is their strong ground. So they're trying to confer the universe, uh, the properties of God in the universe, um, and therefore they're really pantheists, not really atheists, really pantheists, in the sense that they make the universe God. This view is contradicted by philosophy, but they're not philosophers, and they don't really accept philosophical arguments. It's also um, contradicted by science. So I'm going to show you how science itself refutes them by looking at the very controversial Big Bang Theory, um, which, yeah, we're, we're going to cover this very controversial topic. Um, because the Big Bang Theory, um, I'm going to show you, shows that the universe has a beginning and that it's very finite, that it's contingent, that it's obviously created by God, that the Big Bang Theory stymies atheists. It puts them in a very uncomfortable position. So just try very briefly, um, Einstein, he tried to imagine what the universe would be like if Maxwell's equations for light held true throughout the entire universe. And this is how scientific theories work. You create models. So he created a model of the universe. He said, if Maxwell's theories, uh, equations for light hold true throughout the entire universe, what kind of universe would that be? And he created a model for the universe. And then he came up with these theories that matched that universe, the theories of relativity, the special theory of relativity, the general theory of relativity. And what his model of the universe demanded was it demanded a universe that was finite, a universe that is expanding and so constantly changing, a universe that is also limited in space and time. So this is precisely a universe that has all the hallmarks of a created universe and not a godlike universe, a universe that has the properties of God. There was a Catholic priest um, who actually worked, who was a friend of, of uh, Einstein. His name was Father Georges Lemaitre. He was a Belgian priest who studied at the Louvain um, under Cardinal Mercier, who was uh, trying to be part of the Thomistic revival that was taking place um, after the pontificate of, of Leo XIII. And he drew some important conclusions from Einstein's theory. There's Father Lemaitre. Um, notice this is pre-Vatican II. He's got his cassock on. Um, and he's got physics on the board. Um, so he published a paper in 1927 and effectively said, look, if Einstein's theory is true, what his theory is predicting is that the universe is expanding. In other words, the heavenly bodies out there, the stars and galaxies and so on, they're, they're not so much moving in the universe as they are moving the universe. They are stretching the universe over time. So he took that um, extrapolation from the Einstein's theory and he says, look, if this is what's happening over time right now, all right, and we go back in time, what do you get? You get this. And we go back and back and back and back and back. And eventually you get to a single point that the universe would originate with a single burst of energy, which he called a primeval atom. He wrote a book entitled The Primeval Atom, hypothesizing the universe might have started in this way. Um, so in that perspective, the entire matter slash energy of our present universe, okay, so one of the aspects of, of um, Einstein's theory is that matter and energy are convertible. You know, the formula E equals mc squared. On one side of the, of the equation, you've got energy. On the other side, you've got mass. So um, energy and mass are convertible. So um, the universe, in this idea, the universe started off in an enormously dense state at a single point, and from there expanded over a long period of time up to the present day. There was an atheist astronomer, Fred Hoyle, um, who in a BBC radio interview, he wanted to make fun of it. He had a, uh, an opposing theory, which was called the steady state theory. The steady state theory held that the universe um, was completely homogenous and um, effectively infinite and eternal. 
he called the theory the Big Bang Theory to make fun of it. Now, what I want to point out in this perspective of if you're an atheist, you want the universe to have certain properties and how the Big Bang defeats all properties. If the Big Bang Theory is true, then the universe is finite in time because it began with an initial burst of energy. If it's true, the universe is finite in space because it began with a single point and it's been expanding ever since. If it's true that the universe is forever in a state of change because it's continually getting bigger and less dense and cooler. So sometimes I take the example of a cup of coffee. If you take a cup of coffee, it's coffee restricted to a narrow space. If you take that cup of coffee and you pour it, on the ground, you just toss it on the ground, you spread out the matter of that coffee, and it's going to become cooler. It's automatically going to be cooler because the matter of that is spread out. It's less dense. It's the same with the universe. Likewise, if the Big Bang Theory is true, then the universe is surely caused by God for what could possibly start the universe off in such a way with an initial burst of energy than a being who is outside of time and space who is incredibly powerful, much like the, the God that we know. So if the Big Bang Theory is true, then when you go to talk with atheists, then you have um, a very strong argument to make on their ground. You can say, okay, you accept the Big Bang Theory, so what? What caused it? What set that off? And what kind of being is necessary? Would you accept the natural conclusion that your intellect makes upon having this scientific conclusion? And you can put them in a very uncomfortable position. Just to show you how uncomfortable position that is, I have this video um, that explains, it goes over the same ground that I've covered. If the, um, the guys in the back could launch that video for me. I take a drink of water. This is further confirmed by a series of remarkable scientific discoveries. In 1915, Albert Einstein presented his general theory of relativity. This allowed us, for the first time, to talk meaningfully about the past history of the universe. Next, Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre, each working with Einstein's equations, predicted that the universe is expanding. Then in 1929, Edwin Hubble measured the red shift and light from distant galaxies. This empirical evidence confirmed not only that the universe is expanding, but that it sprang into being from a single point in the finite past. It was a monumental discovery, almost beyond comprehension. However, not everyone is fond of a finite universe. So it wasn't long before alternative models popped into existence. But one by one, these models failed to stand the test of time. More recently, three leading cosmologists, Arvind Bohr, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin, proved that any universe which has on average been expanding throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past, but must have an absolute beginning. This even applies to the multiverse, if there is such a thing. This means that scientists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Any adequate model must have a beginning, just like the standard model. It's quite plausible then that both premises of the argument are true. This means that the conclusion is also true. The universe has a cause. And since the universe can't cause itself, its cause must be beyond the space-time universe. It must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused, and unimaginably powerful, much like God. So it puts atheists in a very uncomfortable position. But guess what? It just gets better after that. It's, it doesn't stop there. If you accept the Big Bang model um, for the, the beginning of the universe, there's another problem that arises for the um, universe deifying types. And that is the question of fine-tuning. What scientists have discovered is that what they're able to do is they're able to model the development of the universe. You start, you start the universe at time zero, and then you run it forward. You take the current laws of nature and the physical constants that we know from nature at the present moment, and then you apply them to that initial burst of energy. And you say, 
how would the universe develop if we started the, time, the, the clock at time zero? All right? And you, you see how it would develop into the universe that we know right now. The universe that has all these stars and galaxies. The universe that presents this spectacle at night of the night sky. And then they say, what if we changed the configuration of the universe just a little bit? We change it in this, in the, in the uh, gravitational constant. We change uh, the weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, what have you. And what they find is that if you change any aspect of the physical configuration of the universe in the slightest bit, then the universe would not have developed properly and you can never get stars and galaxies. You could certainly never ever get a habitable planet such as Earth. And this makes it seem like, wow, the universe is extremely finely tuned by who? So, in other words, the chemical, not the biological, the chemical evolution of the universe had to be very specifically configured. In other words, in my book, I support the idea of a chemical evolution. We can replicate chemicals turning into chemicals. Whereas the idea of biological evolution, life forms coming from non-life or less complex life forms turning into new, uh, more complex life forms, that's not replicable. In fact, it has no empirical evidence behind it. But the Big Bang Theory does have empirical evidence. This is a species of chemical evolution, which is reputable, as opposed to biological evolution, which is not scientifically reputable, as I argue in my book. Part of a book I don't have time to cover today, but you're really going to enjoy it if you read those chapters. <laughs> so this fine-tuning of the universe produces overwhelming evidence that the universe is designed. I asked the men in the back to show this second video that explains this notion of fine-tuning. Not to be. 
be surprised by the special features that the universe has. He's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. Okay, so that's the fine-tuning of the universe. Um, another aspect of the Big Bang Theory that makes things extremely uncomfortable for atheists. So the question becomes, um, why don't believers embrace the Big Bang Theory as um, a very powerful tool to defeat atheists? I mean, that's, that's always a fun thing to do, you know, just be able to say to atheists, well, what about this, you know, especially on their own territory. Well, um, there's a lot of people uncomfortable with the Big Bang Theory, even though it's proposed by a Catholic priest um, among Catholics. Uh, most people don't know it's proposed by a Catholic priest. Um, most, I mean, yes, very unfortunately, um, a lot of even traditional Catholics have um, gone to Protestants for their view of scripture and science, and it's just um, not healthy. But I want to address, um, I want to reassure you that, that I'm not a, a modernist um, maniac here. Um, I want to cover my own back. <laughs> by addressing a few objections that, that might come up. Um, people are very afraid with, with, with evolution, uh, and rightly so, because evolution is used in order to um, sort of project an atheist worldview. However, uh, I've made the distinction between chemical and biological evolution. So um, people think the Big Bang Theory supports evolution, but no, it does not support biological evolution. Big Bang Theory has nothing to do with Darwinism. Darwinism is a theory about life. Big Bang Theory is a theory about the universe. It's about the development of inanimate matter, not animate matter. Okay, so there are two different topics, and we have to make the distinction between those two different topics. And when I support the Big Bang Theory, I'm not supporting Darwinian evolution because they're two different things, very different things. Secondly, the Big Bang Theory, you know, when Father Lemaitre rolled back the clock and saw how much time it would take to compress the universe to a single point, he found that it would take 13.7 billion years. And people are like, whoa, well, that's just what evolution wants, because evolution relies on time. The evolutionists need lots of time. And I say, okay, that's true. They need lots of time, but they also need something else. They need to specify a cause that's working in time. So if I give the, the evolutionists, for instance, four billion years, it's estimated that the Earth is four billion years old. If I give them four billion years, they've got to give me laws of nature that we would expect non-living things to turn to living things in those four billion years. And it turns out, that we can run these numbers now, okay? We know what's necessary for life. Every single living thing relies on the cell. And one of the major components of cells is the protein. Proteins are made of amino acids. There's 20 different types of amino acids. It's only left-handed amino acids that are, that are used in the cell. So amino acids must be put together in a very specific sequence in order to form a protein. And so we can run the numbers as to what are the chances, if you just have random interaction of matter, for there to be a single formation of a single protein. If you give the, uh, the evolutionists, if you, if you say, we take all the, the, the particles in the universe, 10 to the 80th power of particles, if you have them interact 10 to the 43 times each second, and you take 10 to the 17 seconds since the universe started, if you give them all those interactions, what are the chances of getting a single protein? Chances are one in to, uh, 10 to the 24th power, which, you know, um, your chances are much better with the Powerball. A lot better. Okay. Um, so uh, it's effectively zero. There's no chance. There's no chance. So there's no scientific data that, that should compel us to believe in biological evolution, whereas there is scientific data to compel us to believe in the Big Bang. There are two different topics. All right. Let's look at the reactions of the Big Bang Theory and to get back to our theme as to the effect of your worldview on reality and the conclusions that you draw and whether reality is lightsome or darksome. Um, so we'll see the reaction of the atheists, of the Protestant fundamentalists, and of Catholics. First of all, the atheists, you know, um, the atheists, um, 
uh, I've got Robert Jastrow here. He was an American astronomer, NASA astronomer. Uh, he died a few years ago. He died an atheist. But he um, expresses in one of his books, um, I, The Enchanted Loom, something like that. Um, and he, he speaks about the reaction of the atheist to the discoveries of the Big Bang Theory. He says, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> okay? <laughs> So you're doing science, you're doing science, you're, you're, you're asking the universe, you reveal your godlike attributes to me, and when you get to the end, the universe is saying, I was created in time. I was created in time. And they're like, oh. You know? So did Robert Jastrow become a believer? Did he become a theist? No, he died an atheist. He died an atheist. Why? Because of his commitment to empiricism to the, this idea that sense data alone um, it gives true knowledge, and therefore he committed himself to irrationality. He willfully shut down his own reason. He refused to accept the implications of his own science. Science was so clearly pointing him in a certain direction. He refused for reality to teach him because of his worldview. It's really tragic. Um, so. How do atheists deal with the Big Bang Theory? What can you do when science and the universe are pointing you in this, in this direction? Well, they have to get really irrational. I mean, they have to make themselves look totally ridiculous in their explanations, all right? And this is something we gotta point out to them. We gotta point out to them that you are making science look ridiculous. You are making um, your faith seem to be more superstitious than any faith that has ever existed in the history of mankind. Two ways they try to get around the Big Bang Theory. One is the multiverse theory. This is the idea that somehow there's uh, universes are being generated all the time. Universes just pop into being all the time and with different configurations. And we just happen to have the lucky universe. The universe that's uh, really the Goldilocks universe, you know, uh, it's just not too hot, not too cold. Um, <laughs> So, um, but this is, this is not scientific. This is total ideology. Because if there are other universes, by definition, we cannot know it. Because if you wanted to get to that other universe, if you wanted to get data from it, how would you get it? Because it's separate from my universe, right? Okay, so just making this up. Besides, where do these universes come from? All right? Um, and then, I'm not making this up. I mean, this is the title of this book. I read this book, and that, this is one of the reasons why I love chapter nine. I mean, because I get to make fun of this guy. Um, I mean, he deserves it. I mean, he really deserves it. I try not to make fun of a lot of people, but um, I mean, <laughs> there's a certain Schroden fraud there. Um, I, I, maybe I'm not the healthiest, <laughs> but I did enjoy it. I'm sorry. Um, so. He says that the laws of nature demand that universes spontaneously pop into existence. I'm just like, really? I mean, <laughs> I mean, you you want me to respect you as a man of logic, of reputability, as a scientific authority, and you're trying to tell me the universe is spontaneously pop into existence? I mean, give me a break. Um, yeah. If this theory were true, science would not be pop possible. You're destroying your own science. Because we, we wouldn't know, I mean, if, if, if this thing was caused or if it just spontaneously popped into existence, we wouldn't be able to give a cause for anything, would we? We wouldn't be able to know if it just popped into existence. It's like sitting there in nothing. It's like, man, I'm so bored of being nothing. You know, <laughs> man, talk about not having a life. <laughs> let's, let's have some being around here, you know? <laughs> So here he is, Lawrence Krauss. By the way, he's, he believes that um, children should not be taught religion because he believes it makes them feel guilty. And so he lobbies for the elimination of religion from schools. You know? And he's considered reputable in his own field, in the, in the field of physics. And I, I'm saying to the scientists, look, this makes you look really, really bad. This makes you look much worse than the worst of the religious believers. Okay. Catholic reaction, 
Um, our understanding of Genesis, we believe that the Bible is primarily meant by God to teach us supernatural truths, truths that we could not discover by our own reason. Very important supernatural truths. So Genesis 1 teaches very important supernatural truths. There's one God outside of the universe, created that universe from nothing, such that the universe had a beginning in time. That God created man directly and Eve was formed from Adam. Monogenism, that the entire human race has a single set of first parents, that our first parents were created in a state of original justice, that they fell from that state by sin, and the wound of their sin was communicated to the entire human race. The church teaches that Genesis was meant to teach us these truths. And if we look at Genesis, we see that it's extremely effective in teaching these things, that God created everything. The six-day description very clearly indicates that um, God separating parts of the universe and then adorning those parts, which brings home to us that he's in charge of the entire universe. The church does not hold us, make us believe that Genesis teaches. Uh, the church tells us Genesis does not teach the universe is a certain age, the earth is a certain age, human race is a certain age, or that the universe developed in a certain way. So Cardinal Ernesto Ruffini, who is one of the conservative fathers of Vatican II, um, he wrote a book, uh, Evolution uh, Judged by Reason and Faith. He said, God could very well reveal, and who doubts it, in what order and in what time he made the various things appear in the world but in his inscrutable wisdom, he preferred to leave such questions to human research. In other words, God wanted to reveal to us things we could not know by our own reason, and he left us to explore natural truths that we could discover on our own. He gave us reason, sort of like a, um, you know, what you do with your children. You just like give them, send them on a, a, um, a hunt for things um, because you want them to, to exercise their own reason. So the church considers question of the age and the development of the universe to be questions of science that are not part of the revealed truths contained in the Bible. I looked at all the pre-Vatican II scripture manuals. I taught scripture at Holy Cross Seminary, um, and that converted me from creationism of, of the Protestants. Um, and I found that no Catholics hold the Protestant view in pre-Vatican II manuals. So this is why Pius XII had no problem the Big Bang Theory. He gave a speech to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in 1951, indicating its compatibility with the Catholic faith. He said, uh, he, he mentioned the theory pointing to a universe that was between 5 and 10 billion years old. Um, and he said that far from contradicting Genesis, the Catholic reading of Genesis, that this supports Genesis. Here's his quote. He says, although these figures may seem astounding, nevertheless, even to the simplest of the faithful, they bring no new or different concept from the one they learned in the opening words of Genesis, in the beginning. That is to say, at the beginning of things in time. The figures we have quoted clothe these words in a concrete and almost mathematical expression, while from them there springs forth a new source of consolation for those who share the esteem of the apostle for that divinely inspired scripture, which is always useful for teaching, for reproving, for correcting, for instruction. Instructing. So in other words, he had the same reaction as Robert Jastrow. He said, wow, this confirms what we believed all along. And so we should embrace this as something that is um, a new weapon that we have uh, in support of our faith. All right, so the fundamentalist Protestants, they do not like the Big Bang Theory because it contradicts their interpretation of Scripture. So as you know, um, the Protestants put all truth in the Bible. They believe that all God will to put all truth in the Bible. Um, the Bible is the beginning and end of all truth, whereas for us it's only limited. And that God put all truth in the church for us, not the Bible. For them, each individual must find for himself the truth in the Bible. In other words, uh, for Protestants, God willed the Bible to be the source for humans to gain knowledge about himself. There is no other source. That is the beginning and the end of all knowledge. If that is your perspective, that all truths, God will all truths in the Bible, then of course, if God willed the Bible to be used by everybody, and he hasn't given an authoritative interpreter of the Bible, then the Bible must be easy to read. 
It must be accessible to everybody. And therefore, it would be natural for you to choose the literal sense. The most direct and obvious sense would be the sense. You wouldn't be likely to interpret the Bible sometimes literally, sometimes allegorically. You wouldn't expect to um, have a careful explanation of the Bible by an authorized interpreter, a divine institution. So they come up with the idea that God will to tr teach truths of physical science by means of the Bible, whereas if you read the scripture encyclicals of, Pi of Leo the Thirteenth, Benedict the Fifteenth, and Pius the Twelfth, they would say scripture is not a science book. So according to them, the universe was created in six 24-hour days in the exact literal way in order described by Genesis 1 that the universe, the solar system, and the earth were created in a completely formed state around 6,000 years ago, and that the flood, which we must admit happened, but they consider that it can cover the entire earth, um, and that all the animals that we currently have came, were on the, the ark of Noah. We, um, the, tr the traditional Catholic exegetes, pre-Vatican II, would hold that the flood covered all of the inhabited earth, not the entire earth, but all the earth that was inhabited by people. And so what they do is they take these beliefs that they hold are revealed by God, and then they go out into reality and they try to confirm them by certain things in reality. In other words, they're idealists. They try to impose these ideas on reality. No matter what reality teaches them, they will always fit, fit them and these conclusions, and they call their field creation science. Um, so they reject the Big Bang Theory outright on the basis of religious grounds, even though it has strong empirical evidence and it supports theism. By doing that, they make the Bible seem to be the enemy of science, and they make the Bible and religion seem to be the enemy of reason. They fall into a species of irrationality. I grade them as... Um, on the side of idealism. Not completely, I'm not as hard as them, on them as they are on the, on the scientists. They're not as irrational as the scientists, but still, they, they fall on the side of idealism to a certain degree. Um, moreover, if they were consistent, if they wanted to interpret Genesis 1 absolutely literally, they would hold that there is a roof over the earth, the firmament. The firmament is something firm. It's, it's something hard. So the, the Bible describes there being this firmament above the earth and that there's water above that roof, that there's water surrounding the sides of the earth. Um, they would hold that God uses human words and speaks to himself, that God has a body with which he moves over waters, um, and that the earth is flat, because Genesis describes the earth as being flat. If we look at the literal uh, description of Genesis for the universe, um, this is what it looked like. It's, it's the earth is flat, it's resting on columns, um, there's this roof over, uh, over the, the earth that has certain, um, you know, fissures in it. And then there's waters. There's waters over the firmament. And, um, you know, there are some Protestants who are totally consistent with the Bible. And they founded something called the Flat Earth Society. I mean, they actually exist today. <laughs> Another comment I give, I got, I got one of their videos. It's really spooky, you know. <laughs> they say the universe brought to you by the Freemasons and the Jesuits. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> at, least, at least they are consistent with their own principles, you know? I mean, they're being actually, actually consistent. Um, now, what this does, I just want to emphasize the conflict that this creates between uh, religion and science. Uh, I blame the modern perception of the conflict between religion and science on the Protestants. It's wholly rests on their shoulders and their literal interpretation of the Bible. So... What this does, what their view does, is, is it destroys historical sciences. Because if the universe is only 6,000 years old, then it has no real history. Everything was created by God fully formed. Thus, when you find any evidence that the universe might have a long history, 
wherein it developed over time, it has to be discarded. So I use the example of Pluto. So in 2015, there was this probe that, that, uh, that we sent out uh, more than a decade before that finally reached Pluto and took the first high-res pictures of Pluto. So the first time that we really saw the, the details of the features of Pluto, and this is what Pluto looks like, and you see something like that, and you're like wondering how that formed. And if you just use the processes that we know of, um, here on Earth, what you realize would take much longer than 6,000 years, and that would be a natural inference. But the Protestants are going to tell you, no, 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 God created it to look just like this. He created it like this, all right? You would say, well, that's, that's tricky, that's tricky, because it looks like it, it, these things formed, and they weren't created directly, and they would say, yes. In the spirit of Luther, they would say, that's because God wants you to distrust your reason. He wants you to take your reason on one side and the Bible on the other, and he wants you to get rid of your reason for his honor in order to bow down what it says in the Bible. And I say to them, well, that's not my God. You know, my God is not a God who gives me this great faculty of reason and then tells me to put it on the floor and step on it in his honor. This is not a God that you want to love, a God that you want to worship, is it? So the theophobia that we have today, the modern world has a great theophobia, a fear of God. I blame it on the Protestants. Their God idea is very different from our God idea. Secondly, it destroys the principle on what science works. Um, to be able to do science, there have to be natural laws that hold true throughout the entire history of the universe. This is the principle, what's called uniformitarianism. So the laws that we observe today have to have been working the whole history of the universe. If they were, then you can make uh, conclusions about what happened in the past. If the laws were different, then you don't know what they were in the past. and You can't do science, okay? All right, so just in conclusion with this example um, um, of the general thesis of my book, you take the empirical evidence uh, for the Big Bang, which I wasn't get, able to get into into detail, but as I say, it's somewhat compelling. You pass it through the atheist filter, their worldview, the empiricist filter. They're able to ex accept the evidence for the Big Bang Theory, but they reject the implications, the intellectual implications that their sense data is telling them. So they reject reason for their atheist faith, yeah. which is bad for them as human beings. The Catholic filter, we're able to accept the evidence and its implications. We're able to have reasonable faith and reasonable science at the, at the same time. Whereas the Protestant filter, they reject the evidence of the Big Bang on the basis of their literal interpretation of the Bible, so they reject reason for their Biblicist faith. Um, so it's the Catholics, the Catholic faith, again, pushes us towards realism, to this perfect mental balance. And that's uh, a great privilege that we have as, as Catholics. So that's um, an example of, of one chapter of my book, um, Illustrate the General Thesis. If you want to learn more about the book, you can go to therealistguiding.com. Um, I'd be happy to briefly uh, address uh, some questions, if there are any questions anybody might have. I don't want to spend too long on questions because I want you to buy all the copies of the book that are here present. Um, <laughs> Bridget. Yes, you can. You know, um, those videos are made by Protestant. <laughs> so, in fact, most Protestants are not um, fundamentalist creationists, but um, they are made by William Lane Craig. Um, he relies heavily on this argumentation with atheists. He's made a career out of debating atheists. So, you can go to reasonablefaith.org. Um, to find those videos. I do have a problem with William Lane Craig, and that is he does not accept Thomistic arguments for the existence of God, metaphysical arguments. So he only relies on this scientific argument that goes back to the Big Bang. And that's an effective argument. The, but the metaphysical argument leads to a, um, a thicker God, what's called a thicker God, a God that has more of the attributes of the Christian God than a God who kicks off the universe. But that's, um, that's, that's, that's another detail um, that I just throw in there. So don't completely trust yourself to William Lane Craig as if he's the end all for, for these sorts of things. Well, you're speaking about the, the age of the universe. Yeah. Uh, gone to a conference a number of years ago and there was a, uh, 
a NASA scientist, Dr. Brown. Dr. Walter Brown? I guess, yes. Uh, I don't know if he was with NASA. I, th I know he's with MIT. He graduated from MIT. Was, I've spoken to him on the phone, by the way. Okay, he was involved with the uh, landing on the moon. Who? Oh. Okay. And uh, he was an atheist now, unless he's converted, uh, you know, a Bible-believing Christian and Protestant. Okay. Uh, he, he didn't have any use for God, but one of the things he said about the, the time of the universe, because mm -hmm. he was, he thought it was billions of years old, mm -hmm. when they went to the moon and he was part of that design of the spacecraft, he said that there would be lunar dust which are particles in the air that would settle on the moon. Mm -hmm. And with time, after billions of years, there will be an infinite amount of lunar dust. So mm -hmm. they built these pods mm -hmm. for the spacecraft to land right. so we right. can save. Okay, so have you ever studied this? Okay, so I just want to issue a general warning to, to us, all right? And th this is very important. Um, there's lots of conspiracy theories out there. Before you accept any conspiracy theory, you have to study the question yourself, because otherwise you're not making a prudential judgment. When I prepared the materials for my books, as I say, I used to be a creationist myself. I grew up in that, in that environment, all right? So to, to prepare my book, I read the atheists, I read the creationists, I read the intelligent design movement, and when I had read all those materials, I mean, you have to read a lot of books to, to write a book. Um, so I felt like I was in a position to weigh all the arguments and, and really to make a prudential discernment as to which argument is correct. So whenever I hear someone saying people didn't land on the moon or, I don't know, um, some, some sort of theory like this. It wasn't that it, we didn't land on the moon. Okay. No, he said we did. He was part of that space program. Okay. But as far as the, the lunar dust, they had built these pods so it wouldn't sink in because they presumed that the billions of years would be miles of dust, mm -hmm. but they found out that it was a matter of, you know, inches, right. which would show they could mathematically calculate that the moon was only six, seven, ten thousand years, just right. based on how much dust falls in a, a period of time and then, you know, extrapolate. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, as I say, when I, when I read creationist uh, literature, I find it very compelling if I don't know the other side of the story, uh, something like the, the, the lunar dust. So what I would need to do is I would need to say, okay, how would someone on the side of Big Bang Theory, how would they respond to that, um, to that problem that you expect the dust to be more accumulated? And then I would be able to say which argument sounds more reasonable uh, before I could draw my conclusion. Um, what the creationists often do is they, they try to poke some hole in a modern theory. And let's just say the Big Bang Theory is not able to answer all questions. Um, the question of, for instance, dark matter, dark energy, well, what the heck is that? Nobody knows. We, all we know is the universe is expanding, but we can't really explain the force that is causing it to expand. Does that mean that it's not expanding? No. We've got empirical evidence that indicates that it's expanding. It just means we haven't answered all the questions. Will we ever answer all the questions? I really don't think so. I really don't think so. Can we ever uh, explain everything about the universe? I don't think so. But this is just the best theory that we have up to this point. And in the future, it might be fine-tuned. It might be improved in some respects when we get more data. Yeah. Have you looked into any fields of science such as like evolutionary psychology? And is there any merit to stuff like that, like the work of Dr. Kevin McDonald? I don't know the name. Um, but I, I, to me, that seems to be like the least reputable um, th branch of, of, of evolution where, where they try to justify the development of features of, of animals or humans uh, on the basis of some uh, drive for survival. Is that, is that what you're talking about? Uh, mental states, so like different cultures, having different uh, ways of talking, languages, um, mannerisms. Right. So I, I think the tendency of the empiricist is to reduce all human behavior down to genetic material. I, I think there might be some relation to our genetic material, um, but again, it, I would think we'd have to be substantiated. Obviously, we are influenced by our matter, by our genetic code, um, but at the same time, it's really our highest faculties that are more predominant in determining our behavior. 
You know, I mean, like the difference between uh, the way a Catholic behaves and, and, the, and the way a, a Protestant behaves is more stark, I would say, than the difference between an American and, and an Indian, for instance. Or you, yes. Hmm. Do you have any other tips uh, going along the apologetics route on how to present um, the, the science-based um, point of view to to atheist persons that you've, that you've come across, you've had experience on face-to-face -to, -face to somebody? Like yeah, when, when I see an atheist, um, when, you know, Catholic apologetics, when um, the rule, the golden rule is, when you speak with an atheist, you don't talk to him about religion. You talk to him about uh, something with which you have a common ground with him. And that common ground is reason, and especially scientific reasoning. So that's why I feel like my strongest uh, argument is, is to go talk to them about scientific matters um, and try to point out to them the irrationality of their position, also to show them the logical conclusions of their position. So, you know, if in fact um, the universe is just the long-term result of merely random processes, what does that mean for you as a human being? And are you willing to accept those consequences that effectively your life is absolutely meaningless, there's no nothing meaningless, that there is no free will, uh, that our conversation that we're having here is just really the result of, of impulses of our brains, um, that there's nothing higher than matter, those sorts of things. Those are pretty extreme things. I mean, I've had an atheist who said, yes, I, I am willing to say that I, I don't accept free will. And you're like, well, what do we do then? What do we do? You know, this is absolutely meaningless. Mm. Very good. Maybe we'll finish with a, with a prayer.